Good afternoon, friends and neighbors. It is time now for another networking video. This is Professor H, and I am going to be talking to you this week about Spanning Tree. Spanning Tree comes to us from Chapter 3 of the Pack of Guide to Routing and Switching. And because this is a fairly big topic and can be a little confusing, we're going to cover this in a couple of parts here. So if you'll bear with me over the next couple of weeks, we'll be handling not only how spanning tree works, but going through a couple of examples for you. So without further ado, here we go, spanning tree. So what is spanning tree? When I first start talking about it, I like to sort of explain it as one of those save your butt sorts of protocols. It is there to protect us from a very real problem, and that is loops. Ethernet networks, and most of our networks today are based on Ethernet. Even if you've got 802.11, most of that stuff goes back to an Ethernet network. And Ethernet networks do not like loops, so we want to avoid them. So why are loops so bad? Well, let's take an example here. Here's the topology, three switches in a loop. And if node A here issues an ARP request, which is a broadcast frame, it goes to switch one, switch one, knowing that it's a broadcast and follows the rules, it's got to go out all ports except the one that it came in on. So it sends the broadcast message to both switch two and switch three. Switch three and switch two, obeying the rules, in turn forward them on. And now this broadcast message comes right back around and heads right back to switch one. That's what we call a broadcast storm. So spanning tree says, wait a minute, that's a bad thing. Let's kill off these loops. All right, so here's a little spanning tree uh, tidbit for you. When spanning tree is active, and spanning tree is active on almost every single bridge or switch that we have in the network, there are some exceptions. For example, wireless bridges often do not do spanning tree. And that's because we don't want them to be the root of the spanning tree. And a lot of times, small devices such as those on your home network also do not run spanning tree. But if I hook a couple of PCs to a standard switch or bridge, I'm going to get spanning tree messages called BPDUs. So it's on all the time. While hosts or nodes may receive BPDUs, they don't care about them. BPDUs or spanning tree messages are there to uh, provide spanning tree information or information that's going to be used for spanning tree between switches. So as we see here, one switch will send a BPDU to another one. It is rare to have a switch respond um, with its own BPDU unless there's some specific conditions. And we'll talk about some of those examples later on. Now, there are also four major fields that we care about. There's a lot more to a, a spanning tree message than, than just four fields, but there's four big ones that we really care about. And those are the root ID, the root path cost, the transmitting bridge ID, or just the bridge ID, and then the transmitting port ID, or just the port ID. All right, so what, is, what do these BPDUs look like? Well, from Chapter 3, uh, on page 51, you'll see this particular BPDU. And so this one here is just an example of a BPDU, a bridge is sitting all by itself, and we can see that this came from a particular bridge. Now, if you look in the middle here, we'll see um, a very particular combination of MAC addresses. Now, I'll explain those here in a second, but you can see that in the middle of this packet, both of those MAC addresses are the same. And that means that what we're looking at is a BPDU that came from the root bridge. Now, don't panic. I'll explain what a root bridge is later on. Now, in the next couple of pages, there's another example, but this one is a BPDU that came not from the root bridge, but rather from another bridge. And we can tell that by looking at the two MAC addresses that are used here. Now, the MAC addresses are part of a larger field. So right in the middle here, you can sort of see the root identifier field, and that's all of those numbers together, the path cost, the bridge identifier, and then the port identifier. Those are the four fields that we really care about. The numbers in the bottom there, those are for our timers associated with spanning tree. And again, we'll talk about those in a later video. Well, let's spend a little bit more time talking about our main fields here. The root ID is actually an 8-byte field. It combines two values, the 
bridge priority. Now for Cisco devices and many other devices, that's based on 32,768 plus the VLAN if we're dealing with switches. So that converts to 8,001 in hexadecimal. So all the way at the bottom of this screen, I've got on there that it says, hey, remember that we're doing a hex conversion. So when you're looking at packets, a lot of times you'll see the base 10 numbers. But if you look down below in the hex, what's actually sent across the network, uh, the binary value is the hexadecimal uh, representation of that base 10 number. So 32768 plus 1 for VLAN 1 here gives us 32769. Convert that to hexadecimal, we have 8001. Followed by the MAC address, that gives us our root ID. The root path cost is how far away from the root I am. And you can actually look at this value and get a pretty good idea of what the topology looks like. So if you look at the example from uh, page 51, you can see that the root path cost was zero. And the root path cost that you saw in the example from page 53 was 38, meaning that this particular uh, BPD was caught two 100 megabit uh, links away from the root. So the root path cost is based mostly on uh, link speed. So for a 10 megabit link, the root path cost is going to be 100. And for a 100 megabit link, it's going to be 19. And the 38 that you saw there is just multiples of that. Now another little tidbit here is that if it comes from the root bridge, it's going to be a path cost of zero. The transmit bridge ID is not um, the root ID or the acknowledged root of the, the topology, but rather the bridge sending this particular BPDU. So that's why they'll be different. Sometimes we say, hey, that guy over there is the root, but I am this bridge. And so that's why we see a lot of differences there between those two fields. Uh, again, if they're the same, we're looking at the root bridge. The port ID is also based on the priority and the port number, but this is a much smaller field. It doesn't have anything to do with the MAC address. The port priority is also a smaller value. The port priority is very commonly 128, and that's 80 in hexadecimal. And then this one happened to come from port 1. So we say 80 is the priority, and 01 is the port number. Well, great. We've got this idea of loops, and we've got these fields, and we've got BPDUs. Terrific. What do we do with them? Well, Spanning Tree is both a protocol, which uses the BPDUs to swap information back and forth, but it's also an algorithm. And a lot of times we say it's a comparison algorithm. So what the switches are doing is they're taking information contained within the BPDUs, and they're comparing it with information they already know. And they're using this information from the BPDUs to do a couple of things. Some of the top things that we're doing are listed here. The very first thing that we want to do is elect a root bridge, because that's what we're going to build our spanning tree topology on it. The next thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that there are no loops. So spanning tree main purpose is to eliminate loops. So what's going to end up happening is that you can connect your switches any way you want to. But spanning tree is going to have something to say about it if you have a loop. So spanning tree is going to impose a loop-free structure, or what we call a tree-like structure, on the topology. So one thing to remember here is that in an Ethernet network, physical loops are allowed. You can loop switches back to each other. You can connect a whole bunch of switches in a loop, like the example earlier on. But logical loops are not. So what ends up happening is that spanning tree blocks ports. So these two diagrams here are just an example of what ends up happening. So here's our three bridge loop. You know, maybe there's a router downstream. And the messages start going around, and we see that there's a loop. And so at some point here, we actually have to block the topology. So the upper picture here is an example of the physical topology and how pack, uh, packets or frames might flow if we didn't do anything about it. What spanning tree does is imposes that tree-like structure and eliminates the loop. So the, the actual topology that's used, the virtual topology, the forwarding topology, is actually like the one we see in the bottom image. Well, I think that's enough for today. So what we're going to do is go through an example next week. We'll talk about
the details about how the decisions are made and some of the messages that we'll see and go through that all. So I will see you next week for part two. Well, thanks very much for stopping by, everybody. Again, we're going to do Spanning Tree Part 2 next week. And this was from the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching, Chapter 3. I'm adding more and more to BruceHartPunch.com, so there's configs being added out there. And, of course, the resources page continues to grow. I just also posted a Packet of the Week message, so take a look at that one and see what you think. Give it a try, and the solution to that will be next week as well. Thanks again for listening, thanks for watching, and may your packets always reach their destinations.